screened and I think I will um, is there everything okay looking okay yep, uh, so good. all right thank you um, so good morning everyone my name is Eng Pham and I'm currently working with Professor Jason Abel uh, on a GRDC funded project on utilization of novel genetic diversity to increase Bali year nationally um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Rebecca Vandeler for giving me this chance to talk about my projects. Um, so I uh, would like to give you an background information um, about the current projects. Um, it all happened uh, in five years ago when I first came to University of Adelaide from Vietnam and worked on a GRDC funded project, uh, which enabled the import of the HEP25 Bali populations from Germany. Um, this population were created by Professor Carl Spillen at Martin Luther University at Hahn Württemberg, Germany. So HEP um, stand for Hahn Exotic Bali. He used 25 highly divergent wide Bali accession from the middle regions, which show here in different color, and cross uh, them with um, the spring elite variety barker. There was one row of bike crossings and three row of selfings, so that in final populations, there was an expected level of 25% of the wide Bali genome in each progeny line. Um, the whole population was also genotyped with a Nikkei SNP chip. Um, so we uh, have nearly uh, 6,000 SNP marker for genetic study. Um, so this is the general scheme of the previous project. The seeds were sent to us. They went through quarantines, being screened uh, in quarantines and then re released to us. Then we conduct the drought stress experiment at the plant accelerator uh, here at Wade campus. We also evaluate the whole population in field conditions in 2015 and 16 at Charlick. Uh, and then we come by the phenotypic data that we got and the genotypic markers uh, to um, uh, and use genome-wide assertion mapping to identify uh, y Bali alleles that have positive effect, like increasing trait, like increasing thousand grain weight or grain number per year. So I will go detail into the drought experiment first. Um, due to the limitation in space, so the whole populations were screened in three consecutive years from 2014, 2016. Um, so each year, a set of 448 lines were planted on the same date and they screen at the same um, time. Um, and the drought stress were induced from 32 days to 59 days after planting. Uh, in uh, the control conditions, plants will receive 25% of water content, which means that from, uh, if we use uh, 2030 gram of soy, then we want water 508 gram of water. And uh, in the drought stress treatment, the plant would dry drought to only 15% of water content. Uh, during this uh, periods, also uh, each day, three images were captured for each plant, one top view and two side view with 90 degree horizontal uh, rotations. Um, when the uh, plant tissue was separated from the background, then the pixel count were um, taken for each um, uh, images and the pixel sum for all of the three image per plan work were uh, used at the, um, to uh, can create a trait called shoot area uh, uh, per plan per day. We also use it uh, image by non-destructive trait to calculate other traits such as absolute and relative growth rate, uh, caliber length and convex wound area, which these two traits reflecting the compactness of the plant. At, 90, uh, at 59 days after planting, we measure uh, plant height, tiller number, tiller number, fresh and dry weight, and calculate one index, which is water use efficiencies. Um, we published this paper in BMC Plant Biology. Um, so um, in the figure in the left, uh, it shows you the coloration between shoot area 
which is an image by trait with the dry wish, which is a destructive trait measured at harvest. And um, in this graph, you can sh uh, see that there are high correlations between these two image, uh, is between these two traits. And we were successful in inducing drought stress because the plants um, in the blue dots are those receiving drought stress when the um, plant in the red dots um, receiving the control treatment. Um, and there was a significant difference between them. Uh, in the table in the right, I just put in um, some uh, statistics for uh, six traits as an example. So uh, exposing plants to drushes result in reduced value for old traits, um, except the water use efficiency, which uh, have an increase of 50%. 50, 50 uh, heritability of trait in the drought stress was lower than in the control. And um, in GWAS, fewer QTR was detected for the uh, drought stress compared to the controls. Um, also, because of the time, I couldn't go through all of the traits we measure. So I would just um, put in the GWAS output for dry biomass as an example. And I'm also sorry for the busy table. Um, what I put here is the number of QTL detected, which a total of 39 QTLs for both treatments. Um, I also put in a heat map showing you the effect of YLEO at each of the 25 uh, families. Uh, it, and this also color coded. So if you see a red color, it means that YLEO will reduce biomass compared to the Barker allele at that um, in that family and vibers are blue mean while you're in that family increased biomass. Um, there was general theme we found for not only dry biomass trait, but also of the traits that is many of the common QTL that detected for both in both treatments when co-localized with flowering regulator genes such as PPDH1, uh, VERN1, VERN2 and um, uh, Densol's uh, semi-drop1. Also at any QTL detected, there was a wide variation effect um, from wild Bali allele across families. Uh, we also identify one QTL uh, from wild Bali that reduce biomass and tiller numbers uh, in drought stress conditions, um, increased year numbers in our field trials. And, in, and interestingly, when this populations was um, evaluated for soil stress in field conditions. This QTR were also found and is also reduced biomass and increased tiller number and is improved yield in both control and selling conditions. So we're very interested in this um, QTR on 2H. Um, we also identified two QTR with highlighted in green uh, at which wild alleles increase biomass up to 10% in drought conditions. Uh, now I will switch gear here and talk about um, our field trials in 2015 and 16. We planted the whole population in Double Road in partial replicated trials in 2015 and 16 at Charlick. We measure a number of developmental traits such as data shooting, heading and maturity using Zadok scores. Um, and we also measure year related traits such as ear length or length, ear cow per 50 centimeter, grain number per year, 1,000 grain weight and grain length width and area. Um, this is the um, correlation matrix heat map showing you the relationship between traits. And this is the figures for 2015, but the same trend can be seen for 2016 as well. So uh, we can uh, see that developmental trait highly and positively correlated with each other. Um, so this mean what this means for us is that um, next time we only need to score say one of the traits, say heading, which is easier to measure. Late heading also prolongs shoot elongation phase and also shorten grain filling periods. Um, late lines were shorter and have less year. Plants with more grain per year tend to have shorter grain and reduce grain filling periods. 1,000 grain weight is mainly dependent on grain width and grain area. And um, lesser year number will increase grain width and 1,000 um, uh, grain weight. 
Um, in these figures, um, you can see that the very phenotypic variants of the whole populations are uh, in red bar and uh, in green bar is a, a genetic variant of the 12 control line that we use for the field trials, um, except for green uh, width. Uh, for all other traits, we can see that in HEP25 population, we can find inv individuals that have higher value than um, the controls, especially compass, um, the current leading year varieties now. So this is um, have a good implication that um, breeders, barley breeders can use this line for their works to improve barley yield. So again, we measure uh, a lot of traits and I would not be able to go through all of them. So I just put the result for grain number per year for 2015 here. And uh, also general theme can be found. Many uh, flower regimes co-localized with alkytios and at any QTO detected, there are wide, vari wide var variations of allele effect. And we identify allele from Y valley that increase grain number per year up to two grain per year and uh, uh, increase thousand grain weight up to 13%. So we have found many interesting uh, results from this HEP25 in the Australian environment. Um, that lead us to other questions. Uh, what if we uh, bring this wild leo and put in the Australian variety background? Will they hold and show its effect? And if so, how much do they impact, impact yield? Um, is there any trade-off um, such as linkage drags with this beneficial wild leo? And um, what is more useful, the alleles that increase or reduce biomass in the water limit conditions? So uh, in order to answer those questions, we develop new uh, germplasms. Uh, we select 30 lines that carrying the wild alleles of interest that have higher thousand grain weight and grain number per year or increase or reduce biomass in dry conditions that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, and we cross with uh, three varieties, lateral, compass, and rangers. Uh, these three varieties are high, in, high yielding commercial varieties uh, with different uh, maturities. Um, this is uh, the figure in the lab showing you the breeding scheme. We have one row of bike crossings, um, and then we use uh, CASPI markers to track and identify plants that are homozygous for a wide layer of interest. Uh, we um, advance them until BICOS 1 F4, and by May 2020, we have enough seeds uh, for yield trials at three sites. So it is the plan of the current projects that um, in the next three years, we will conduct 23 yield trials. Um, this year, we have three sites in South Australia, and in the next two years, we will have 10 sites each year. Uh, four in South Australia, three in Western Australia, and three in New South Wales. Sorry. Um, so, uh, like I said, this year, due to the COVID-19, we was uh, cannot go uh, into other states, so we just have local um, site in Roworthy, Border Town, and Tully. We have 108 experimental line plus 12 control varieties, and the pictures um, here showing you the variations in terms of plant high and maturities of our lines. So what are the expected output of our projects? So with this project, we um, aim to identify barley lines with um, higher yield than the current leading varieties, uh, such as compass and planet, or uh, lines that have stabilized yields across multiple environments with high or low rainfall and we will disseminate um, the result freely to grower, breeder, and industry stakeholders. So with that, I want to conclude my presentations. I would like to uh, thank my uh, professor, uh, my supervisor, Professor Jason Evans, for his guidance, and other uh, uh, people uh, from the UA, Julian Taylor, Alistair Peres, and other field team staff. Um, also, I would like to thank other collaborators and um, uh, in the past, such as uh, Team Match, Bettina Berger, 
Chris Bryan and Klaus Billen and Andreas Morris from the Martin Luther University. Um, and I also thank, we also thankful um, to GIDC who provide funding for us to conduct these projects. Um, thank you very much. I am happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Anne, for a very interesting talk. If you do have any questions, can you please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom page and I will um, read them out to Anne. So if you can type um, questions, we've got time for a few questions before the next speaker. Okay, do we have any questions for Anne, please? It's all clear. <laughs> it is all clear. <laughs> okay, if you don't have any questions currently, oh, hang on, here we go. Um, there is a question, um, what is D3 in the table? In the table, uh, what table? Which table? What table? Um, of the GWAS or? Yep. What table do you? Phil, which table do you mean? Uh, the first table. Thank you. Oh, okay. Let me go to the, this one. Is that this one? First table? This is the first table that I have here. Yeah? Uh, the think? next table. He's after the next table. This that one. one. Yep. Okay. Current slide. Um, and he asked about D three. Uh, oh, dwarf. Hang on, dwarf three. Dwarf three. Yeah. Oh, like in the table. Oh, it's just um, uh, um, uh, um. Uh, genes that control plant height, so it's like semi, um, like dense or a semi draft one will control plant height. So it's another genes that control plant structure and plant height um, from previous from literatures that I found and I uh, found that is within um, four centimeters um, of um, our QTL. So I um, put it in at a potential candidate gene. Okay, so Phil's commenting that it's a strigolactone gene, so oh. a hormone gene. So yeah, so I don't know exactly the genes, but it's the name of the um, gene of QTLs, but it's definitely because it's called draft. So I yep. think that is more likely to control like plant high or plant stru structures. <laughs> So I might yep. get Phil to have a chat with you after your talk and he can have a chat to you about that, Gene. And yep, I yep, do yep. have another question from Penny Tricker. Did you also bring in any alleles that reduce biomass? Uh, I, from, no, we only interest because, uh, because usually uh, we would think that, okay, increased biomass may be beneficial. So um, only we select the only QTL that have shown in other like uh, another abiotic stress, like soil stress that show to be reduce something like biomass, but increase something else like tiller number and increase yield in soil stress. So that's why we're interested in this QTL, but we don't um we don't bring any other alleles or QTL that reduce biomass. Okay. And we have a question from Matt Tucker. I wonder whether you have scored the compass cross HEB crosses for plant height in the field this year. Are they taller or shorter than compass? Um, we do. We did uh, score the plant height, and it's um, it's very. Some crosses um, they the same um, and a little bit higher, but some for some cross I think is a little bit high. So. Um, I haven't worked on the data analysis. We just finished field scoring. So, um, but I, from my observations that I do found some lies that are similar to compass height, but some lies is a little bit higher. Okay. 
that's it for the questions that we have so far. So thank you so much, Anne, for a very interesting presentation. And okay. now we will change to our next speaker, who is Dr. Xu Zhuan Yang, who will be speaking on pectin methyl esterases control the longitudinal growth of the ovule and grain in barley. So Xu Zhuan is part of Matthew Tucker's group. And I will hand over to her to start speaking. Uh, good morning, everyone. Now I'm working with uh, uh, Associate uh, Professor Matthew Tucker. Our group's research is uh, focusing on the ovule development before fertilization and the seed development after fertilization. So unlike Anne's uh, research, today I'm going to talk about uh, how we use uh, reverse genetics to find out uh, the function of uh, um, pectin methyl esterase uh, in ovule and grain development. So barley grains are economically important for Australia. The barley grain is actually a special type of fruit called uh, caryopsis. If you cut the grain from, from the middle line, you will see the caryopsis only contains one seed in the spike little hole formed by lemma and paleo. Most of the inner space of the caryopsis is occupied by the uh, zygotic uh, tissue, uh, basically the seeds, so endosperm and embryo. The seed coat, if you can see from here, the seed coat is uh, uh, developed from the uh, integuments and is tightly uh, attached to the pericarp, which is uh, developed from the ovary wall. So, the grain size of uh, barley is one of the important factors contributing to the yield. Generally, the uh, final grain size is determined by the coordination of genetic factors between the gotic control and the maternal control. The maternal control mainly comes from, uh, comes from the spike lid hole, so lemma and paleo determine the storage capacity of the grains. A large number of genes of and the QTLs have been identified as the regulators of spike lid size in rice and barley, establishing, establishing multiple uh, regulatory pathways, including but not limited to uh, like ubiquitin some pathway, G protein signaling, MAPK signaling, and of course, uh, uh, plant hormones. Just like many other flowering plants, barley seed is developed from a fertilized ovule. Ovule is also a potential source of maternal control. In barley, uh, ovule is growing inside of the pistil. The upper pistil here, here you can see is uh, composed of style and uh, hairy stigma uh, to attract the pollens, while the lower pistil is ovary. Uh, which includes a single ovule. Once again, if you cut from the middle of the ovary, you can see the ovule gives rise to the embryo sac, which contains the uh, female gametophytes, showing green here. Uh, and the embryo sac is embedded in a large group of somatic cells called nucellus, showing orange here. The nucellus is then surrounded by a uh, double layered integuments. After fertilization, the nucellus cells will uh, rapidly degrade through programmed cell deaths to allow the grain filling happen. As you can see, barley ovule uh, has a large uh, volume of uh, nucellus, uh, which occupies about 70% of the uh, volume of the uh, whole ovule. Um, since the the nucellus is the largest part of the uh, ovule, and there is ov one, only one ovule in the ovary of uh, pistol. Uh, this uh, arouses our interest to investigate how nucellus size is linked to ovule size and further to ovary size, even to grain size. There are already some positive correlation has been found in between the ovary size and the grain size in barley and the wheat, but uh, more such 
uh, connections that has, has, haven't been addressed yet. Bali OV, uh, sorry, Bali New Cellars comes from a small group of cells under the epidermal cells of uh, ovule primordium. So before the uh, meiosis of megaspore mother cell, the new cellus doesn't change much, but after meiosis, the new cellus cells divide and expand rapidly. So this is the key stage of uh, increasement of new cellus size. Now we try to uh, change new cellus size by manipulating its expansion. The pectin muscle esterase uh, which is able to transform the newborn soft esterified pectin into stiffer, mature, uh, un de esterified pectin, uh, hence uh, increasing rigidity of the cell wall. Generally, PME is a negative regulator of cell division. Um, PMEs are involved in many. Uh, progressions in plant life. Uh, however, we still don't know what this family uh, is doing in ovule. We firstly examine the cytological characteristics of Barley nucellus. As you can see here, in mature ovule, you can uh, find two types of cells. The inner nucellus, which is uh, close to the embryo sac. Cells are large, expanded, uh, while well, in the outer new cellars, which is further to the embryo sac, cells are quite small, um, almost occupied by the nucleus. This gives us a clue to compare the uh, pectin on their cell walls. Antibody LM19 can recognize the esterified pectin and visualize the distribution pattern. The LM19 labeling signal mostly concentrated to the inner new cellars rather than outer new cellars. While the outer new cellars, you can only see some spotty uh, signal in the joints between cells. Also, the difference between uh, two types of uh, new cellar cells uh, indicate the different uh, activity of cell division. Uh, H4, uh, histone 4 is uh, marketing of the S phase of mitosis. We use the histone 4 in situ hybridization to label the cells duplicating DNA ready for division, perfectly matching the uh, area labeled by LM19. So you can see the inner new cellars are quite silent in cell division, while outer new cellars are very active in cell division. To find out the uh, candidates of PME genes functioning in new cellars, we use the strategy that combines laser capture micro dissection and RNA sequencing to find genes expressing in new cellars. So we have a, a few selection standard. Firstly, this PME must be highly expressed in new cellars after meiosis, and it cannot be expressed in the grain. So this helps us narrow down from 39 homolog to two genes in um, Bali genome. So we named them as the ovule pectin modifier one and two short as OPM1 and OPM2. You can see their expression disappeared after fertilization. So that means they are very typical uh, new cellars genes. The QRT-PCR also, also showed that OPM1 and 2 are both highly expressed in pistol compared with other floral organs or vegetative tissues. And within pistol, after the uh, female gametophytes start, uh, start meiosis, the, both of the gene uh, expression increased until the maturity of ovule. Uh, further, we use the in-situ hybridization to verify its tissue specificity. Uh, both genes are expressed in the new cellars. Uh, OPM1 expressed in both inner and outer new cellars, while OPM2 is preferentially expressed in the inner new cellars. It is uh, commonly uh, accepted that pectins are secreted from the Golgi to cell wall 
in esterified uh, status then get modified uh, by the PME pack, by the PME protein that are localized on cell walls to uh, verify the subcellular uh, localization of our two PME proteins, we transiently express the OPM1 and the 2 fused with GFP in onion epidermal cells. So compared with the GFP driven by 35S promoter, uh, both fused protein clearly show the uh, apoplastic uh, localization. And also the target P prediction uh, indicate the existence of a signal peptide and a non-organelle localization. That means uh, both uh, OPM1 and the 2 are localized in cell walls uh, like normal uh, PME proteins. To assess the roles of uh, pectin modification in barley ovule development, we created the double mutants of OPM1 and 2 by uh, through an optimized uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system, which allows uh, multiple uh, targets in just the one vector. As you can see here, the editing events, including deletion insertion uh, in one sequence or a large deletion between two sequences aiming to one gene. Accordingly, the mutations result in frame sheet a shift or premature stop coding of an amino acid sequence of both genes, um, hence the dysfunction of the proteins. So we firstly examined the, the um, we firstly examined the, the uh, uh, deesterified pectin um, distribution pattern in the mutant. So in wild type. When the uh, female gametophyte undergoes mitosis, uh, the deesterified pectin starts accumulating in the nucellar cells surrounding the female gametophyte. And those cells compared with other small, almost rounded cells, those cells are relatively larger, uh, polygonal. And you can see the straight outlines of the cells. And this pattern continues uh, also, sorry, also those cells are silenced in cell division. Uh, this pattern continues until the maturity of the ovule. However, in the mutant, uh, we can see those, this, uh, firstly, the uh, the esterified pectin labeling completely disappeared in the new cells, and the cells seem irregular. And also the inner new cellus region seems expanded. If you compare the width here and here, you can see the inner new cellus seems to expand more. To further investigate how the uh, uh, the terrified pectin affect the development development of ovule, we created a um, transgenic line that expresses a uh, in PME inhibitor in your cellus. So PME inhibitor can bind to and counteract the PME, as you can see here. Uh, we used uh, the uh, MAT31 promoter, which is a new cellus specific promoter, and also fused the, the uh, GFP with the PME inhibitor to visualize its expression pattern. Uh, here we show two lines that showing uh, expression of PME inhibitor in the uh, new cellus and also compromised level of uh, the esterified pectin. So we use the, this transgenic line and also the mutant together to see if there any change in new cellus size and ovule size. So we can see but in both uh, transgenic line and the double mutant, uh, the ovule length is increased, but not much, not change, uh, the, the waist doesn't change. Also the embryo sac just become a little bit wider. That means the 
increase of ovule length mainly comes from the nucellus, um, not from the embryo sac. Now it comes to the ovary size. Ovary size also, ovary, ovary length also increased in both uh, transgenic line and uh, double mutant. Uh, this time the width become uh, also a bit wider. We, you know, so we analyzed the, the uh, correlations uh, between the dimension of uh, ovule and ovary. Here you can see the ovule length, the correlation, uh, sorry, the ovule length and the ovary length are more positively correlated than the ovule width and ovary width. Also, ovary width is correlated, positively correlated to the ovary length. So we speculate that the uh, mutation of uh, OPM, both OPM genes, mainly change the, the length of the ovule and which further affect the ovary length through the coordination between tissues. Now we have a chance to see if all these changes could result in the change of grain. Firstly, they, we examined the uh, speckly uh, size. Uh, it didn't show any difference either on length or width. This excluded the effects from a lemma and a paleo. And uh, the mutant uh, produce longer grain, uh, which also increased the, the length width ratio. And we also observed the similar results from the transgenic line. Here's a bit summary. So here we identified two PME genes, OPM1 and 2, are responsible for modifying the pectin in the cellulose of barley ovule. And the modified modification or modified pectin could be a factor regulating the cell morphology and the expansion progress in barley ovule. Um, changing the pectin modification status by knockout OPM1 and 2 affects ovary, ovule length and the green length. Um, so here, besides the lemma and the paleo, we propose that ovule or ovary is also contributing to the maternal control of barley grain development. We also have some uh, future questions to answer. Uh, it is uh, very common that PME genes are induced by low temperature. So it will be interesting to see the interaction between the mutant and uh, either low or high temperature. And also, considering the mutant has a, seems has a larger uh, embryo sac, it will be interesting to investigate if the, it's, this will affect the ratio uh, or proportion of endosperm and the embryo. Uh, thanks to my supervisor, Matthew Tucker, and uh, Laura Wilkinson, who uh, created the fascinating database of laser capture and other lab in Tucker's lab. This research is funded by uh, ARC develop, uh, Discovery Project. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Shuzhan. Um, it was a very nice story that you told then. And if anybody has any questions, can they please type them into the Q&A box? Um, yep, the first question from Ryan Whitford. I'm curious whether your loss of function double mutant has any pleiotropic effects on the growth and development. OPM2 seems to also be expressed in anthers. Was any reduction in male fertility observed? Uh, yes, so uh, we actually didn't uh, see any difference between, uh, between wild type and the double mutant during the vegetative uh, growth. So although OPM2 also expressed in the uh, stem, but the plants didn't seem shorter or dwarf. So it looks pretty normal. Uh, about answer, so we checked the, the you know, we checked the, the uh, fertility uh, of the mutant. It's a bit lower. 
However, we however we don't know it's because of the pollen or it's because of the ovule. It's uh, the fertility of the mutant double mutant is slightly uh, lower. Uh, we also observe the um, reduction of uh, LM19 labeling in the pollen, which is supposed due to the uh, loss of function of OPM2. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Yep. A question from Penny Tricker. Did you also bring in, oh, hang on. Uh, We've already done the last question. No? Yep, no, it's repeating on me. Okay, so are there any more questions before we finish for today? I'll give you another quick 30 seconds. No. Otherwise, we will thank both our speakers, Ann and Shujan, for doing a great job this morning. And um, next week is our final WRI, WRI webinar for the year. And so next week, um, Associate Professor Ken Chalmers will be speaking on multiple genome assemblies reveal alien interaggressions and alternative haplotypes in elite wheat and barley cultivars. So hopefully you can all join us again next week. So thank you very much again, everyone.